yeah. And so, what's that button? A little bit of setup we need to do in terms of Zoom, in terms of the presentation. We have the presentation ready. And we just want to be just watch me so that I do everything right. First, I'm going to share a screen to here. And you see that. Yep. Yep. And then I'm going to present. And that will do this. And then the key bottom is, though, corner, bottom left corner. Bottom left corner? Oh, yeah. And then I do this. And I get my speaker notes. <laughs> And, and um, then, you're gonna have to do it. Go to the settings. Remember how you do um, the two screens? Oh, I don't. I have to non. Uh, yeah. Kids these days. Normally, Dad knows more about tech, but this time. Oops. Some water. Reads correctly. So quickly. Don't mirror them. There we go. So now we have this up here. So, Dad, tell me which uh, uh, what DC is right now. Blank white screen. Okay. Well, well, we'll just redo that in a second here. So this guy. Why don't I do that and then? Um, actually, why don't I escape? Whoa. Escape. Don't you have to Why are you doing that? Yeah, first is inherit. First is inherit. Oh, and then you kept doing it. Do this. I'll just have to un unfull screen it, which is okay. And then we'll try this. Where we resolve it again and we'll share that with you in a second we're going to get the speaker notes open down here and the speaker notes will be here look at that guys they're nice and big now oh, something good. is nice about that i don't know how that worked but that's great see nice Look at that. Oh, that works beautifully. Okay. Now we'll come back to Zoom, which is you guys. And we will present, share our screen. Wait, aren't we already doing that? No, we lost that piece. Which is? Um, what? I think what we'll do is we'll just share um, all of desktop. No, I'll share all of this. I'll share that window. There we go. Now, there what is. do you guys see? We see what is life and investigation by Reed and Liam. Right. Okay. Small, small shot of the on the side. In the, in the corner on the side. Okay. Well, that was about to be replaced by the true presenters themselves. I think this is is good enough here, guys, right? The, yeah. These Great. this picture for here. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah. Good yes, his dreams lying upside down on the floor. He has no idea. I mean, hey. Okay. Work. Come, Lambs. No, I'm going. Okay. Uh, it's so uh, I will uh, introduce our speakers tonight. Our speakers are Reed ah. Quirk and Liam Waring, who are the brother um, uh, team of primary investigators. Um, and so they're happy to share their recent research and uh, with you. First most, up is Liam Waring. The most brilliant intellectuals of the century, may I add. Oh, okay. uh, well, yeah, that's, nice. that's actually usually something that I would say. So you don't even say it about yourself. Well, I actually need to see yeah. the master's in middle school though, so. Okay, can I do that? Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. you stop. Child. Read, read, no. read, don't touch. No, I was helping him. Okay. No, you weren't, just, I don't. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anyway, um, so welcome to our presentation, everyone. Good evening. Okay, so um, anyway, throughout the entirety of this presentation, we're gonna be asking like one overall general question, that being, what is life? So life is everywhere, it's all around us. Even in this picture, as you can see, we have the seals, those are living. There's 
animals and plants and even tiny bacteria in the water that's living. There's plants on these rocks that are living. But for us to like really answer this question, we're gonna need a definition of life. So let's take a look at one of those. So this here is NASA's definition of life. So according to NASA, life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Um, so there's a lot of big words there, but um, before we move on, I just have to say, we aren't gonna be talking about Darwinian evolution in this presentation because we haven't learned about it yet. But anyway, let's put together some of our own definition of life. So let's take a look at some characteristics. So our first characteristic of life is homeostasis. So what is homeostasis? It's sort of like this, the, our body's like great balancing act. It keeps things like heat, body heat, water, blood pressure, et cetera, in check to keep us alive. So even in this past slide here, as you can see, this may, this picture here may look completely random at first, but if you look closely, you realize that this person's clearly working hard, right? And they're sweating. So sweat is a perfect example of homeostasis. You can see this person's working hard and heating up quickly. And if the body kept heating up, it'd be dangerous and they could overheat and no one likes that. So the body starts sweating to cool off. And the same is also true in reverse. Say you're outside on a really cold day and you start shivering. That's again, the body's way of warming up. Shiver is Shivering is movement, which eventually can heat up the body. So another characteristic of life is organization. So in this case, organization basically means that every part of the body does its own job, does one job and works together in conjunction with other parts of the body. And finally, another characteristic of life is metabolism. So metabolism is a sort of complicated one. So let me try to define it quickly. So basically metabolism encompasses all of the chemical reactions that go on in your body in order to keep you alive. So like digesting food, growing, all of those chemical reactions that go on in your body. So here in this slide, all of this is all of the metabolism, all of the little chemical reactions that go on within a single cell of your body. So it's everywhere. It happens all the time. So anyway, growth. This is another characteristic of life. And this is a simple one. All growth really means in general is that all life gets bigger over time. And once again, we have the response to stimuli. So before we try to define this one, we're gonna to have to define what a stimulus is. So a stimulus is basically like an object that triggers a reaction. So see, this kid is putting his hand on the hot stove like an absolute idiot. He then realizes that to keep his hand in that split second, to keep his hand on the stove, would burn him and that's not fun. So he takes his hand off and says, ouch. And even in this case of this flower or tons of different types of plants, it recognizes that the source of light, which is one of the things that it uses to get energy to grow is coming from over here. So it slowly bends over to that. And that's a response to the stimulus, which is the light. So next we have the uptake of matter and energy or eating. Anyway, all life consumes matter and energy in some way or another, but not all life eats like we human and animals do. Like take trees or any plant, for example. Um, the trees can suck up water and nutrients through their roots and absorb sunlight through their leaves and convert that into energy through very complicated processes, which we're not gonna get into right now. Um, but finally, we have our last characteristic of life, which is reproduction. So reproduction means that all life can reproduce. All life can make more of itself in one way or another. Trees have seeds, so do tons of other plants. Ferns have spores, flowers have pollen. Animals, some animals lay eggs, some animals give birth. Even teensy weensy bacteria can grow large and then split into two copies of itself. So all life, can reproduce and make more of itself in one way or another. And finally, there's been one big sort of outlier that I've been neglecting to mention, and that would be viruses. 
So viruses are sort of like on the doorstep of life between the box of living and non-living things. Um, so they do fit into many of our characteristics of life that we've shown here, but also they don't fit into many others. So let's take a look. Viruses could be living because they can respond to certain stimuli. Say a virus is floating around in this huge void and <clears throat> it hits a cell. The virus will connect to that cell and start injecting its genetic material into that. So basically, cell, the stimulus, the virus responds to the stimulus when it hits the cell. And <clears throat> viruses do evolve faster than almost anything else on the planet. They're very organized and they do reproduce but only when a host cell is making more of them. Can I ask you a question, Dreams? In that yeah, of course. image, do you think the whole <clears throat> object there is a virus or is the red thing a cell and the green things are the, This whole object is a virus. So gotcha. viruses have these proteins all yeah. along the outsides that they use, they can, they can use to like connect to cells. Um, so yeah, that's that whole thing is a virus there. Cool. But now here are some characteristics that viruses don't meet. So they do not grow. They can't. They don't have any metabolism. They can't reproduce on their own. Like I said, they need a host cell to be creating more of themselves. And they don't eat or consume matter or energy in any way. And they don't have homeostasis. So in the end, what we can really take from these viruses, what we can really learn is that life is really complex. There isn't one simple definition that fits for everything. Um, everything's going to be outside of the box of life somehow, somewhere, which might be able to be in it through some other definition. But in the end, it's extremely complicated. And although this is sort of an anticlimactic climax um, to my section of the presentation, it can't really be defined simply. So now I'm going to hand it over to Reed. Here you go. Thank you, Liam. And today I'm going to be talking about somebody called Louis Pasteur. And before we get into talking about him, we're going to think about why was he famous? And the reason he was really famous is because first he improved our understanding of microscopic life. And he did that using science and experiments. And then with that knowledge, he improved our health and our food safety. And he was a chemist who lived from who lived from 1822 to 1895 in France. So as you can tell, this happened a little while ago. And if you have any questions, please ask them at the end of my part of the presentation. And if you can, just like make up some if you can and uh, like remember them for the end. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so first we're gonna get into, we need to understand why Pasteur was famous. And to understand why, we're going to have to think about um, how people thought about life at the time. So people used to think all small things like ants and smaller things like microorganisms and bacteria and also viruses, um, they thought it emerged from food, inanimate objects. And as you can see in this picture, it's forming as, from breadcrumbs. So say you leave bread out on your back porch, eventually it will turn, they thought it would turn into an ant. Mm -hmm. Or also say there, you had like a chunk of meat and you accidentally left it out. They would think maggots and flies, you come back later, obviously the maggots and flies actually came there, but they thought that it just grew out of the meat. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea of spontaneous generation. But Louis Pasteur did kind of believe it, but nobody had ever done an experiment to prove this. They're just like, Hey, this makes sense. Uh, we should just go with this. So he was like, okay, how can I do this? And what he did is he took three, he had three different treatments for a set of um, sealed bottles. And the reason they were sealed is because if there were any bacteria living, the, it, living in there, they couldn't get out. And if there were any outside, they couldn't get in. And um, the reason they can grow in there is because there's nutrient broth, which is a type of food, really. So then they can actually survive. But as you can see here, he applies heat. So he heats it so that if any bacteria are in there, they die. And in the first treatment, they 
don't they don't open the flask they don't do anything with it and it's just closed and then for the second the second and third they expose it to air in two different ways and in both of those there are bacteria present in the first one there wasn't and you might be thinking okay whoa slow down why exactly did it just disprove spontaneous generation and the reason it does is because as you can see in this picture he doesn't do anything with it it's still sealed so that means if spontaneous generation was a real thing they would just grow out of it with without having to get in or anything but as you can see in the second and third they can get in the way i'm not sure why they can get in this one but they can <laughs> and yeah. just like you said in the first slide he improved our knowledge with those ex ex science and experiments and then with that knowledge he improved our health and this is pasteurization and you might have seen on your milk jugs in your house but you probably not are you probably aren't looking for this but it will say pasteurized on this and pasteurization is a process of sterilizing food with heat and sealing yeah you're right heat and sealing just like in the last slide he seals it so that if any bacteria are inside or outside, they can't get in and they also can't get out. And then heating, they kill all the bacteria that are in the milk jug. So this is pretty cool because he pretty much makes us smarter and then makes us safer. Hmm. And here's kind of another way he improved our uh, knowledge and our health, but mostly just our health. So um, this is how vaccines work. And First, you um, kill or damage the pathogen, which is the virus or bacteria, and inject it into your body. And after that, you will, your body will automatically be like, oh, this isn't supposed to be here. I'm going to create antibodies, which are little warriors, you could say. And they will um, pretty much memorize what this, what this is like. So then when the real thing comes back, the uh, you'll be able to be like oh this is whatever came before and your body will be able to fight it off and you might be thinking why are we talking about vaccines and stuff and that's because pasteur made three major uh, vaccines for cholera anthrax and rabies wow and also you might be thinking wow this is what they use for everything but it's not the one um, vaccine that's an outlier is the COVID vaccine, which is an mRNA vaccine. And um, we're not gonna get into that because we didn't learn about that in our uh, presentation. I mean, in our uh, science class. And uh, after that, we have Pan Pasteur's anthrax uh, experiment. And I always wanted to call this the two sheep, one goat and several cow method but um <laughs> my dad said to say farm animals that's shorter and easier and easier to remember so i'm gonna say he takes farm animals and he injects half of them with the damaged and wait with the vaccine sorry yeah. and um yeah. okay yeah, then you would with well with his vaccine and then he waits 30 days and injects them all with a live bacteria oh so yes he is killing animals but um all the ones that didn't have the vaccine died. Wow. And you may be like, okay, well, we'll slow down. Um, the reason this um, this is why this is the reason this works is because all the ones that were vaccinated survived. So that means this vaccine works. And last, we have what we've learned so far. So from Liam's slides, we learned that life doesn't have a simple definition. We can't just be like. Boom, this is a definition because it could be completely right, but it's not going to be complete. But it couldn't be complete because that's just, there's just so much to life. Life is a giant concept. And then we also learned how milk is pur purified by uh, heat heating pasteurization. And I only knew about this until my dad and my brother showed me that it says past pasteurized on mm. the edge of the milk jugs. And this pasteurization was a big thing because back before it was pasteurized, uh, people would get sick more often. And I also learned how vaccines are made from, made from uh, dead pieces of uh, uh, bacteria or virus. I never really knew this. I used to think that 
back, they would just inject a tiny bit of the virus into you. But I, they, that would be, that's really how the virus spreads. If it, if a tiny bit of gets into you, it will be able to spread really quickly. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like, okay, this makes more sense because if it's dead, then they can't really fight back. And also, I also learned that not that um, life for doesn't form from food or um, inanimate objects, but I learned that people used to think that um, small animals like ants and uh, bacteria and other stuff like that um, would form from inanimate objects because I, I always thought because like the first thing you learn about um, microorganisms is that they're everywhere like they're on the floor you can get them from everything but actually they're just they're um wait one sec I'm sorry I lost my spot um you're talking about how the second to last animals sometimes emerge from okay yeah but I never knew that um people used to think that I thought it was just the a concept that you learned when you were like three or four. Mm. Um, and lastly, we have um, how Louis Pasteur improved our knowledge and then um, with science and experiments and then improved our health mm-hmm. because that's really important. It's just like, it's making us smart because that's what most scientists do. They make us smart, but they don't normally improve our health and our food safety. And now I'm going to hand it back to Liam. Wow! Nice, guys. Thank you. Nicely done. Thanks. There's our date off switch over. Okay. So um, now I'm going to start getting into what we've done and our projects, how it went. Wait, well, okay. Um, so anyway, before we got started with our project, the slides are skipping forward too fast, I'm sorry. Um, We had two major questions. Um, One, where do we find microorganisms most easily slash period? We weren't sure if we were gonna find any when we started out with this experiment. And can microorganisms live in frozen water or ice? Um, So these are the two questions we started out with. And then we got into our experiment. So first off, We collected water and like water samples from multiple water bodies around in our area. One being the swamp in our backyard, two streams from the forest and the lost pond behind the high school. So um, then we took our samples and put them on microscope slides and observed them multiple different magnifications. We then recorded everything that we observed. We took drawings, notes, videos, pictures. And finally, here's what we found. So we only found life in the swamp water sample, um, which may have made, read shush, um, uh, sorry. Um, we only found life in the swamp water sample, which makes sense because there was a whole lot of, um, a lot of um, plant matter in, um, there was a lot of plant matter in the swamp water sample because it's really just a bunch of like, decomposed leaves. So there was a bunch of stuff for our microorganisms, our microorganisms to feed on. Hmm. And we didn't find life in any other samples, um, which makes sense. The water was flowing fast. It was deep. It was cold. So it wasn't really likely that we'd find anything. But in our swamp water sample, we found tons of different types of microorganisms. We couldn't scientifically um, name any of them, but we had a few guesses. We named our own. So we had fun. And Finally, um, so we have a spinner, a little spinny dude. He's really small. Um, we have a worm and we have these flippy turnies, which are basically the spinny things. I guess we just may have put this two drawings of the same thing. Not sure. Um, we have these little droplet guys, this really long thing, um, which we named a battleship because it was huge compared to everything else. And a tardigrade, which I labeled tardigrade because poop is funny. Um, <laughs> we don't know that it was a tardigrade. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, like I said, we didn't find life in any of the other samples, but we were encouraged by the fact that we found any microorganisms at all, let alone the number of microorganisms that we did find. What month so, did you sample? Do you remember? I don't remember. 
Um, sorry. Anyway, um, so then we're encouraged. So we went back to the backyard swamp to collect another sample. So anyway, this time it was completely frozen over. So we broke off some of the ice and carried it back home. And eventually, once the ice melted, we were surprised beyond belief to find that there were still microorganisms living in the frozen ice feeding off of the um, off of the plant matter in it. It was crazy. Um, so then, here's some pictures of what we found. So at first, it's kind of, it looks sort of random. What's living in here? How do we know this is a living? How do we know this isn't just a bunch of plants, a bunch of dirt? So anyway, just take a few guesses at what you think are living in these pictures. Hmm. The, uh, the, the translucent oval thing with a little bit of gray on the bottom side. Yep, yep, that one. Okay, good guess. The one that looks like several uh, several straight lines. Yep. Yep, that, that one and that one. Okay, good guesses. So here's what's actually living in these slides. This, this, and that. Uh -huh. So um, this is really surprising. Water droplets. Um, we're not sure. They, what you guys pointed out, may have once been living creatures that are just now dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the oval shaped one really, really does look alive. It's probably an air bubble. Um, so, anyway, um, these are the three that we knew were living because they were moving of their own accord, clearly eating off of plant matter around. Um, so, it just goes to show there, it's impossible to predict without actually being able to see them moving around and going through their little lives. Mm. Um, so, anyway. In case you didn't believe us, in case you thought we were completely lying about um, seeing microorganisms for one reason or another, um, so let's take a look at a video of what we found. Ah, I can't start it. <laughs> Bring your cursor, your cursor up. up. There ah, you go. got it. Boom. Hello. So, right off the bat, we can In see the that there's microorganisms moving around yeah. everywhere, all over the place. You might even be able to see um, some of the types of creatures that we saw in the last slide. Oh, wow. And these are living and not being um, moved around by a current because they're moving in opposite directions. It's not like the current's pushing them in one way or another. And they're sometimes doing complete 180 degree turns. Yep, yep. And as you can see, there's tons of different types. We weren't, like I said, we weren't able to scientifically name any of them, but we know there's a lot. They're there. So, Finally, in conclusion, what we've drawn from our study and our experiments, um, living things can be extremely tiny, literally too small to see with our eyes. And there are microorganisms everywhere around us. Um, we may have only found one or two samples with them there, but they were all over the place in those samples. They're, they're everywhere, basically. Um, and there's tons of different types of microorganisms too, just because we weren't able to like actually name any of them according to the real scientific names doesn't mean there weren't a lot of types. We couldn't even record some of the ones we saw. And we found microorganisms only in the swamp, which was interesting. But like I said, maybe it was because it has more plants and organic matter for them to feed on. And finally, this was just mind blowing. Some microorganisms can live in ice, which we, we were really surprised to find that. So, um, Finally, I guess, do you guys have any questions? So that's I, it. Well, thank, uh, let's, can we clap first or do we? Yeah, yeah, yeah great job, gentlemen. Thank you. That was great. Questions from the grandparent side. Yeah. My first one is about what do you call, do you know, do you guys know what you call it when the plant aims toward the light? Oh, um. <laughs> No, this um, phototropism, maybe? I know sigmotropism. It's pho photo or helio, yeah. It yeah. It's toward the sun. Okay, thank you. That's, that was just my guess. I think, I know that when plants react to like a touch, that's sigmotropism. Yeah. It's like photo, so I was just, it's just, just my guess. Good. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, you have one, too. Not yet. I also wanted to know if you read anything about life being found in antarctica i we did we did not no okay 
just yep excellent okay um, okay anything else Grandpa, any you on your, did you try looking on your skin on our skin no, we, no i mean we did actually take pieces of dead skin and observe them under the microscope but like i said we only took like tiny bits and yeah. didn't find anything just on that sample yeah. and maybe they're just extremely small but um we don't know yeah I have a question. Yeah. So when you went back to collect more water samples, did you go to Lost Pond or did you do that nearby? No, we only did, we we only went back to collect more water samples, like I said, from the backyard swamp because that was the only one in which we had found life. Oh, I had been under the impression that the only one in which you found life was Lost Pond. No, no, it was the backyard swamp. Oh. We might have found some in Lost Pond. No, it was way too deep. I thought we found like one okay. moving guy. Huh. No, I Interesting. Don't, I don't think we did. Dude. Um, Lost Pond is alive with sounds today. I ran by it because of cool. all the amphibians. It's just going bonkers. It's really cool. Awesome. Do you have any questions, yeah. Grandpa Tover? Yeah, I do. I I need some uh, speculation on thy part. Okay. Given that the backyard swamp had a lot of life, and your speculation is that it's because there was organic matter. Mm -hmm. If you had sent you, the two of you guys had sampled either the stream or lost pond at different depths. Yeah, we may like, well have found. Like, like a depth that was uh, six inches down from the surface and six inches up from the floor. What, what, what do you speculate would have been the result of a depth sensitive sampling i imagine we may have found some if we had um because there's a lot more organic matter down towards the bottom just because gravity really is just pulling it down there there's yeah. like dead leaves that are rotting some dead animals and stuff and anyway so there may have well been microorganisms feeding off of the stuff there we just didn't find any yeah, yeah. also like say in the forest streams um those were like fast running um, really quickly flowing, not a lot of organic matter, um, just dirt. So it wasn't surprising that we didn't find any there. So again, you know, in the forest stream, the location of the sampling might have been like a real critical factor in whether you found life or not. Totally. So if you sam if you put your scooper right in the middle of the stream where it's flowing fast, you might get one result. If you'd put your scooper near the edge behind a rock close to the moss yep you might have found a different totally that would have, that yeah. would have been a, a follow-up experiment this is of great I, I hope you'll go on with this because i'm thinking of uh eyebrows and eyelashes and i think yeah the, the yeah totally. grades have been found there there's known to have been like microorganisms living in our eyebrows and eyelashes yeah yeah, yeah really disgusting <laughs> It's it is gross to think about. Yeah. Hey Reed. Yeah. Given that you guys found microorganisms that live in the ice, or maybe I should say survive in the ice until you melted the ice and looked at it. Yeah. Um, what would be thy speculation about microorganisms living in rock? Inside or like on the edge? In like literally hundreds of meters down inside the rock. I bet there probably is because it's just like in every single nook and cranny, but I don't really know. We we can't see like all the super small things, but I feel like there might be. That's good speculation. It would be a fabulous experiment some days to, you know, get a rock and break it open and examine it super carefully. Totally. We're going to need to get a better microscope then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ours, ours, like uh, the Mac is like a thousand something X, so, which is good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, Liam, yeah. Um, yeah. Pasteur was famous for a bunch of things the pasteurization of the milk, mm -hmm. the, um, the vaccines for those three uh, different diseases. Does he know anything else he was famous for? So yeah, the, the invention of the vaccine, pasteurization, disproving spontaneous generation. Um, 
I'm not sure. I don't know anything else. Did you else. have an answer, B? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. asked me if you did. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so yeah i don't know of anything else i mean there probably was given the fact that you asked that question but he's he's a he's a sort of a standout in the early scientific world mm -hmm. and he you know he, he his way of thinking about things led him to some understandings that obviously nobody had even thought about before mm -hmm. yeah Are you you're talking about in terms of the method depth uh his methods and and also just sort of uh cons you know speculating that a body could generate antibodies by in effect training it with a dead virus yeah yeah crazy totally yeah wondering how he knew that he had dead virus um yeah yeah before he, he, he inoculated those animals with it. Well, they did have microscopes back. Okay. Did? Yeah, yeah they did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reason, I, well, I think mm -hmm. the reason. Yeah, they must have had good ones. Is because, let me see, and that picture right there. Uh huh. Oh, but viruses are viruses are also yeah. extremely small. Right there. Not like anything we could yeah. see, yeah. even yeah. like one of our microscopes. Doing stuff with bacteria, so anthrax is a bacteria. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anthrax is a bacteria. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So finish your your answer, B. My answer. What for do you what? think about? So, uh, see if you can. Do you remember Mom's question? Uh no, I don't. How do you? How did he know that the bacteria was damaged or killed. I think he might have done one of the same things the heating methods uh, I'm pretty sure he did that I feel like you told me something like that didn't you? We, we didn't we did not spend much time on the vaccine part of it so um, yeah. we haven't researched that hmm. um, one thing that I was even confused about and still am um, is why is this open to the air the bottom the one. one i agree yeah i don't get that because it doesn't look very open does it the end yeah. must be okay. the end must be the end is the end mm -hmm. might be open the yeah. end of these but then i don't get why they couldn't have gotten in here yeah the, the end of these weirdly uh is open huh. and so uh it so it's maybe just like in like swim through the water oh i, I get it because they tipped it if the ends are open yeah but the buck, is that right? I mean, I think if we were to look into this more, I suspect it might be a um, like a water lock. Uh, yep. So if you have, if you put a little bit of water down in the bottom of the gooseneck thing, then that means air can't go can't go up it over the curve and into your flask. And and so the top one is sealed by that little bit of water. The second one is broken off, so it's open. And the third one. Your your nutrient broth actually touches the water, and so the air can then touch the nutrient broth. Huh? Is I think, but we we didn't go into it more. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So and that the blue color is water. Yeah. Well, it's not blue. That's no, red. that uh, here this this bit you mean? Yep. Just, I think that's just air. It's nutrient broth, so it's pretty much just like food ish. The red, that they put the, in there. So the, 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 the red part is the nutrient. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the bluish gray part is air. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a puzzle as to why number one and number three aren't the same. Yeah. Yeah. Although if there's a non-visible water lock at the tip, as Tim was saying, that might explain it. Be. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. So B, I had a question. Well, can, let me ask one of Reed first. Is okay. That right? So Reed, and can you point the thing at Reed so they can see it? I think Pasteur's experiment is really cool. I don't fully understand it because I don't have all of the details, but I think only two treatments would be needed to disprove spontaneous generation. Yeah. It's, well, Which ones would they be? The yeah. well, either this one and this one, or the, the number okay, the three. first one, the third one, or the first one and the second one doesn't really matter. But the thing is, just I bet he was just doing this to make sure 
and doing another way of doing it just to make sure he wasn't just running into a coincidence. Yeah. A very common coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had a question. Um, do you know how long he let these flasks sit? Because it was so um he heats it and all it says let it sit in each of them that's for a day or so I think it said. Okay, okay. Got it. Because uh, I've been told like, that you can make how long he lets them sit. If he just lets them sit for like ten minutes. Ten minutes, maybe even an hour. Oh, this is just not gonna be anything. I've been told that I can make sourdough if I just leave the uh, you know, little salt and flour and water mix out. Mm-hmm. But I've, what's happened in my case is that it just turns horrible color and rots. Yeah. Right. So, uh-huh. but the bacteria are everywhere. Uh, you know, you don't have to do anything but leave it. You get the right bacteria, you can make sourdough. Wow. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. There are a lot of them out there. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. You know, one thing it would be fun to do to follow up with this, guys, is to do a little pasteurization ourselves. Totally. So, uh, and we can basically get a, get some sort of substrate that we know will grow bacteria, mm-hmm. so that we know we can create it and it can grow it when we when we just leave it out, and then what? take that same stuff and you know uh, seal it and 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 heat it on one of them and don't and and uh, do the same thing on another and then open it and see what happens. Not heat it. Mm-hmm. I wonder if bread left out really if it makes a um, penicillin mold. We've done that, haven't we? Haven't you guys put bread in a container in the hideout? Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it did it mold. Under a bit. Yeah. But yeah, we did that. Right? Yeah, and it, and it did mold. Yeah, I remember when we took it out, it was like blue and green. Yeah. And yeah. Hair, it was yeah. so gross. That might be penicillin antibiotic. Mm. So read. Um, I've been looking at this experiment that these puzzled over, and I actually uh, took the time to read the text. So he boiled the flasks with a nutrient broth to kill any bacteria. With the first treatment, he didn't open the flask. In the other two treatments, he opened the flasks in different ways so the bacteria could get in. The first flask was closed, The second flask had its neck removed and the third flask was turned so that it was exposed to air. And he said he opened the flask in different ways. So my bet is that he nipped nipped the end (coughs) of that long skinny part off so that it would be exposed to the air in the room. Mm Because yeah. he said he opened the flasks in different ways. Yeah. It might be the airlock still, though, because technically he was doing something to it. So he is, he is opening it, but I don't know. So yeah. to, to add to what Pasteur did, before he got to his work on the virus, he was interested in that question of spontaneous generation. And Reed, as Lee said, a lot of people just believe that meat turned to maggots and that was it. Um, and he did a very beautiful experiment where he took two pieces of meat. One was that he just left out on the porch and one that he put in a bowl and he put a a silk screen like cheesecloth over the top of it. So air could get in and out, but the flies couldn't. Mm -hmm. And in about a couple of days, the meat that was left out open had maggots and the meat that was in the bowl never got maggots yep yeah mm. that i think when we were looking for so when we were looking for pictures for these slides i think i actually saw a picture of that act that um that experiment which is yeah, cool. yeah it's a pretty famous experiment because that was his first sort of uh beginning to understand that things didn't spontaneously grow that they had to have a cause and effect and have eggs or some way of reproducing. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, for a fly, you know, a raw meat is a food source. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, gentlemen. One more question for, you. for each of you, which is okay. what, what would you like um, 
to, to explore more about uh, microorganisms in particular. Ooh. If I get a better microscope and see if they actually might have been the one killed. Yep. And I have <coughs> grids because they say tardigrades are awesome. are super common moths. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That'd we can cool. get some moss water after it uh, um, warms up a little bit. Totally. Mm -hmm. Or it actually rains a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about yeah. you, Lemur? Um, let's see, there's a lot that we didn't explore that I think would be cool. I guess I, I, uh, I was thinking of this question and I had an answer in my head. I was thinking about, um, like it was sort of addressed before and I was like, oh, I know what I want to do, but now I can't think of what it was. Yeah. Um, wait, flip, flip through the slides, that'll probably remind me. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> here in our um i guess oh yeah do what grandpa topher asked like check some different places mm -hmm. see where else we can find go. them yeah 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 i would also like to you know oh and try and area. try um and try actually like heating one of our samples, like boiling yeah. it and yeah. see if they all have died. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Reproduce so. mess as true. I know I'm not a violent microorganism mass murder. I just <laughs> it's, it's, it's for science. <laughs> it's for science. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, think of so how I, I have a mechanical question for both of you. When Reed, when they was using the microscope, yeah, did they could they actually f uh, manage to focus at four hundred and one thousand magnification? Okay, so one thousand was pretty hard to focus at. We could definitely do it at four hundred. Four hundred was our normal magnification, but a thousand, like if you just hit not like a table because tables shake more, but our island, which is pretty much completely connected. If you hit that, it will completely go out of focus. Yeah, even like and touch also, the island, which is connected the to the is, ground. You, um, once you've got it close enough for, to the slide for a thousand X, you can't even see that they're not touching. It looks yeah. like they are touching. So you don't even know what you're doing and you just go a tiny bit and then you're like, okay, I don't want to smash the slide. So I'm just not going to yeah. go farther. Right. It's hard. Yeah. With that, with that amount of magnification, like you said, the lens of the microscope is super close to the slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, guys, congratulations! That's a pretty cool yeah, presentation well for done. both of you. Well done. Hi. Thank you, guys. That I was have one quick awesome. comment about your communication. I think you two do such a nice job of presenting. Oh, I did. I. I have done such a very better, very much. I can't talk. I, uh, I did a better job practicing. I thought you did a great job. And there were a few things yeah. I noticed in particular. I noticed that you both have great intonation. When you speak, your voices move up and down and you convey a sense of excitement. I noticed that you both made comments like, um, you might be thinking right now, or you might be, so you're actually talking to your audience and you're predicting some of their thoughts, which signals you're trying to connect with them. And then you both did really nice jobs where you would loop back on what you'd said and discuss the significance. Like Bede, you talked about, okay, let's review what we've learned. Or Leems at the end, you talked about conclusions that helped to highlight to your audience, okay, why have we been talking about this thing? Why should we care? Anyway, I thought all of those things were great. Awesome. Good work yeah totally yeah absolutely good job guys yes yes thank you wait one good thing job. i noticed Teacher i'm not sure if i can so um the second i paused the timer the um uh slide timer I'm just stop the it was it um wait, okay what? I saw it, at 40 minutes, like it was it minutes ago. i paused it exactly at four four zero zero four <laughs> wait, you paused nice it. i remember i pointed out to you 